Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing another part of our Jurassic World Evolution 2 mod spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts and today we're moving away from all those remodels, things like that we're getting back to some new species which I'm quite excited to talk about so we're going to be starting off today first one is Anacurus by uh, Leaf and... Uh, Viral Cyclops, as you can see here. Look at that. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's uh, release these guys. So we've got these wonderful guys here. These are the uh, Anicurus. So these guys are a type of elephant uh, or type of proboscidean. A better way to put it. Let's get a good picture of these guys. So Anicurus, really, really wonderful guy here. Uh, these guys are an elephantoid uh, proboscidean that is native to Afro-Eurasia, so native to Africa and Europe and Asia. They lived from the late Miocene, so uh, about 8 million or 8.5 million years ago up until the early Pleistocene, so about 2 million years ago. So they lived for about 6 million years. And the type family of, uh, to that type genus of this family was described by um, Augustine Armand in 1855, where it was originally considered a Gompathir, but uh, has been later assigned to the family um, Elephantidae, so type of elephant. And um, most recent analyses show that these guys may have been more similar to Elephantoidia. So these are quite close relatives of the Abod the Elephant. And you can see they are, look quite similar. They stand about 3 meters tall, about 9.8 feet tall. Weigh about 5 tons. And they closely uh, resemble modern elephants. And um, aside from their somewhat shorter legs, uh, they look a little bit different from modern elephants because of their really long tusks which have been known to grow up to about 4 meters in length, which was uh, really interesting. Though these tusks were very likely um, defense weapons, very similar to today's elephants, and the molars were actually not composed of the uh, laminae like those of uh, true elephants, but they had cusps that were a lot like the uh, teeth of like pig molars or tapir molars, which is really cool. And this gives us a little bit of uh, insight to its ecology. It's um, Anacurus is believed to have lived in forests, eating trees and shrubs and also digging for roots and tubers on the forest floor, and potentially would have died out during the Pleistocene as uh, grasslands became more prevalent. But though there are stable isotopes uh, from Ethiopian Anacurus from about three to four million years ago, from a tooth of Anacurus, and it suggested that it may have also grazed, but most likely would have been a big part of their diet. So... Um, the most recent species, as this one described here, is um, Anticurus uh, afrimensis, or afrinensis, I believe you say that. This was the most recent species and lived in Europe, uh, so it would have lived during the early Pleistocene, so about 2 million years ago, and was the last living species, and potentially the largest. And um, dental microwave from this particular species suggests it was definitely a browser, which can eat things like twigs, seeds, fruits, and bark which uh, really makes sense for its ecology and the time, because right before the beginning of Pleistocene, uh, um, the world was a bit warmer than it was now, so there were lots of trees and forests in Europe. But yeah, really, really awesome uh, animal to cover, stunned by leaf and viral cyclops. So we'll let them walk out and do their thing. So let them speed up a bit. Just don't want them getting in the way. Now they're moving on. So now let's uh, grab our next animal. This next one was done by LA Studios. We've got Takia. So we've got a really, really beautiful one here. This is such a beautiful skin, I think. 
So this is uh, Takia, which means brainy one. Uh, these guys are a type of herbivorous ankylosaurid from the Lake Cretaceous of Mongolia. So this guy was discovered in 1970 with a Polish-Mongolian exhibition uh, discovering a skull of an ankylosaur in um, Kulistan. Uh, in 1977 and it was described as the type species of Takia, um, Takia Kelani, which uh, derived from the name of uh, Mongolian Tariki and Latin ear, so they're referring to the brainy size, and it's believed to be because its brain size was larger than a uh, relative form um, Sariskia, which is pretty cool. The holotype was discovered from the Upper Cretaceous, the uh, Baran Gramot Formation, which was previously known as the Lower Namekt, and it comes from the Campanian Mixtrictian Age, so right at the end of the Cretaceous. And this holotype has, um, along with some other specimens, has a pretty good idea of like the free tail vertebrae, the tail club and scutes, and the skull as well, so pretty well known. And also the geographically one of the youngest of all the Asian ankylosaurs, and um, in 1997 there was also another species, Takia gigantea, that was described. But um, there's really only two or three species known at the moment. There's Takia Kalani and Tereskis A. And um, there was actually one just described uh, in 2021, uh, T. Uh, Termonove, which is, comes from a partial skeleton with associated skull as well, which was found in the Nemex formation and makes it co-equal with the uh, species T. Teresa, which it could be lumped, but there's at the moment two or three species uh, from that, also micro uh, Minotaurosaurus might be lumped into these groups, but very interesting. Um, size estimates have been lumpy, uh, generally based on uh, Dryptosaurus giganteus, which was one of the largest ankylosaurids known. Uh, this would most make the longest. It has a body estimated about 8 meters long, so quite a long body as you can kind of see here. And um, there's the skulls for much smaller individuals, and the holotype of um, Tachia Kelani and Minotaurosaurus also indicate they might be that size as well. Um, as an ankylosaurid, you can kind of generally see that it's got that low body. The estimates for the body are include kind of like 5.5 meters or 18 feet long and about two and a half tons. So they could very much get a little bit bigger than that if you're going by that other estimate. And as similar to ankylosaurs, it got this low slung body with uh, the short stout legs and all these osteoderms along its back, which were used to defend itself and also this large tail club that they used to defend themselves as well. So really, really interesting. I uh, do love how this guy's come out. LA Studios always does a wonderful job. Um, from what we know, uh, kind of where, how it got its name, it's, it was pre previously distinguished from Saruskia by the base of its large uh, base of cranium. So it looked like it had a bigger brain, but there are a few other things that kind of describe it that show it a little bit different. And um, in terms of its phylogeny, uh, these guys are kind of more related to other types of uh, Asian ankylosaurs that include um, Talo, um, Pinocosaurus and things like that. But its most closest re relatives seems to be like Sakia and Zarapelta, uh, even those kind of relatives, things like that. Uh, uh, Pinocosaurus and things like that. Really, really interesting animal. Uh, not too distantly related from most other ankylosaurs, but just like how beautiful this is. This is uh, such a great ankylosaur. In terms of its habitat, it's believed to be these guys would have lived in interdune environments with like lakes and sea streams. And we know that it was a desert animal, but there's also evidence these guys may have lived in well-watered forests and things like that. We also know that they may have been preyed upon by animals such as Tarbosaurus, which is a close relative of T-Rex. And the reason we know that is because we have uh, one skull of Takia, which shows tooth marks that has been identified by Tarbosaurus. And that is evidence that these guys would have been hunted by Tarbosaurus, which is really, really cool. I've got to say, this skin just looks beautiful. Takia is such a such a beautiful model. LA Studios always does a wonderful job with uh, bringing their species to life. And um, Takia is definitely no exception to that. So we'll let them run off and do their thing. LA Studios, as I mentioned, I've got to congratulate them again. Really did a wonderful job. So let them walk off and do their thing. And next, moving on to uh, some big bad mammals. This is by Jasuba. We have got Megatherium. Let's let these guys split off a little bit.
There we are. Let's have a look at these wonderful big guys here. Let's have a look at you. Here we are. Oop. Keep messing up a little bit, but that's alright. We can see here our wonderful ground sloths. So this is uh, Megatherium. So Megatherium is a... Which means great beast in Latin. These guys are extinct genus of the ground sloths that lived from the early Pliocene to the end of the Pleistocene. Their best known species is Megatherium americanum, which is the giant ground sloth, also known as the Megatherium. These guys were native to the Pampas region and uh, southern Brazil during the Pleistocene. So in terms of their description, these guys were one of the largest animals of its habitat and actually one of the largest mammals known. They weighed up to about four tons or about 18, uh, 8,800 pounds uh, and um, with a shoulder height of about 2.1 meters or 6 foot 11 and had body length of about 6 meters uh, from head to tail. So very, very large animal. And these guys would have also been one of the largest of the ground sloths, if not the largest, tied with like a rare theory and things like that. Uh, they were also one of the largest members of even the Pleistocene megafauna and comparable in size to the elephants and things like that, which is really interesting. As you can see here, they've also got quite a robust skeleton with a large pelvic girdle, um, not pelvic girdle, uh, pelvic girdle, yeah, around the back here. They've got a big butt and they've got a short tail there. And it's believed that these feet as well, uh, even though they're on the side, this would allow them to kind of raise up on their back legs to be able to feed from browse and things like that being in this almost tripod position. And like a modern um, anteater, these guys would have walked on the sides of their feet, as you see in the back here. And um, that prevents its claws from uh, getting flat on the ground. And although they were primarily quadrupedal, as you can see here, there seems to be evidence of sloths walking uh, bipedally, which is pretty interesting. And they have some adaptions for that. And a little thing about these guys, there's been some evidence looking into ground sloths and people have been talking about how the larger ones may have been hairless. So um, to put that to rest, uh, because of uh, m being a xenarthrin, and xenarthrins have a lower metabolic rate than most other mammals, it's very likely that animals living in cooler environments, such as megatherium, would have most likely had at least a short coat of hair. But its close relative, arematherium, which is about the same size but lived in warmer habitats, even ranged up into Florida, may have had a short coat or even been hairless. So Megatherium's not the best example because it liked those cool environments, but Arematherium could very well be a giant hairless sloth, which is very, very interesting. And you can see here, there's also got some adaptations for uh, eating uh, plants and things like that. They've got a long cone-shaped mouth with prehensile uh, lips and a long tongue. And um, this is believed to really help them be a selective eater. These guys would have been eating things such as um, browsing and leaves and twigs. And there's some evidence that suggests they have like a large hyoid, which means they potentially use their uh, tongue to uh, take in um, food, almost like a giraffe, which is really, really cool. And um, these guys also had deeper jaws. So this guy, uh, most ground sloths are really differently adapted for things. So there's some species of ground sloth with really wide mouths adapted for grazing. These guys would have been very much browsers, so browsing on the high trees. Especially when they tripod up, they'd be able to reach the same height pretty much as a giraffe. So they were pretty much a giraffe in their ecology, which is really, really interesting. And also, um, like other sloths, these guys actually lack enamel, dentine, and the dental cusps and other mammals. Instead, their tooth is layered in a um, layer of Serentrum, um, ornithodentine, and modified orthodentine, which creates this soft that is easily uh, abrased surface, which is really interesting. And they also exhibit extreme hypsodonty, which indicate these guys had a gritty, fibrous diet. And they also interlocked, uh, which shows that these guys would have been eating a lot of like tough food, or fibrous food, which includes those, obviously, those trees and things. Really, really interesting. So in terms of the first fossil specimens of Megatherium were found in 1788 uh, on the banks of um, the Lujan River in Argentina. And uh, also those were born, brought to the comparative anatomist George Cuvier, who discovered the relationships between these guys and lots of sloth, which is really, really interesting. And um, Cuvier believed that the Megatherium was a sloth and he used its large claws for climbing trees like modern sloths, although he did suggest that they dig tunnels, which... Did turn out to be true. We have evidence of uh, sloths uh, burrows, which is really, really cool. 
But um, yeah, these guys would have been living in mainly woodland or grasslands environment throughout South America, around the Pampas, where they became extinct about 10,000 years ago, as we talk about. Uh, these guys were more adapted to uh, temperate, uh, arid or semi-open habitats uh, compared to Arimatherium, which had lived in more tropical um, areas and invaded actually North America during the Great American Biotic Interchange. So Arimatherium was a little bit more northern, living in Florida and uh, Brazil, while these guys would have been living more south, like Pampas and Bolivia, places like that, which is really interesting. So in terms of their ecology, these guys would have lived mostly in groups based on Arimatherium. And, but may have also lived singly in caves. And they also mainly kind of uh, browsed in these open habitats as well and eating like moderate to soft food, but also some twigs and things like that. And since these guys didn't have too many predators, they would have been uh, quite a open sp uh, species hanging around during the day. Uh, the giant ground sloth, these guys were herbivores feeding on all sorts of trees and plants and things like that. And uh, while f uh, feeding Tristley on chiefly on terrestrial plants, these guys would get on their hind legs and be able to use their large fore claws to kind of um, bring down uh, branches and bite leaves off them. And they use their simple teeth to grind down their food. And they also had highly developed cheek muscles to allow them to process the uh, coarse and fibrous diet that they had. And um, a recent actually analysis shows that these guys may have had a strong vertical biting, which is really, really cool, and also have hypsodont or bilophodont teeth which means that these guys were used for cutting and um, hard fibrous food was really not that primarily part of their diet. So these guys would have been eating a lot of softer plants, which includes obviously uh, leaves and things like that compared to grasses. And um, there's been some talk about whether they've carnivorous, uh, but they would have likely potentially scavenged. But um, most evidence suggests like carbon isotopes suggest that these guys were very similar in most other um, uh, megafauna herbivores such as mammoths and glyptodonts. So these guys may have scavenged on carrion occasionally, but they were most likely uh, purely herbivores. But in terms of their extinction, uh, like most of the other Pleistocene megafauna, these wonderful ground sloths went extinct around the end of the Ice Age, about 10,000 years ago or so. And we don't know why. There's some evidence to suggest that the suitable habitat would have actually shrunk during the mid-Holocene. And um, so th there would have been less food for the sloths, less habitat for the sloths, and they would have gone extinct. But also the fact that humans would have hunting them, though they're obviously huge animals, and um, they've got osteoderms under their skin, so that would make them very hard to kill, but not impossible. There is evidence of them being butchered, but um, it could have been a combination of these factors, could be diseases. It's a very complicated topic, the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. So any of those regions could be really, really cool. Uh, explanations for it, though not really, really cool as in they're dead because they're such wonderful animals, but really teach us a lot about how the ground sloths went extinct. But yeah, really, really awesome animal. How can you not love this guy? Joserba did a really wonderful job covering the ground sloth. Uh, nice to see them in the game. So let them walk off and do their thing. So now we're moving on to the lagoons. Next one's done by Leaf and Luca. We have got the Titanoboa. There we are. So let's have a look at you, long boy. So this is Titanoboa, which names mean Titanic Boa. These guys are an extinct genus of very large snakes that lived in northern Colombia. Uh, these guys would have been living around that area during the middle to late Paleogene, so right after the extinction of the dinosaurs, about 60 to 58 million years ago. And um, these guys got quite large. There's been estimates between 12 and 14 meters, or 42 to 47 feet, and a weight of 1,300, uh, 135 kilograms, or two and a half, uh, two and a, two and a half thousand pounds. Really, really huge. So the one species known is uh, Titanoboa um, cyanogenesis, which is the largest snake ever discovered, and. One thing about these guys, although they were originally to be considered apex predators, skull bones suggest that these guys were actually more likely specialized to preying on fish. So they're less like a giant anaconda, more like a giant, like um, Java uh, file snake or something. But really, really interesting. We'll get to tell what's at that. So this guy was discovered in 2009. There was fossils of about 30 or so um, Titanoboa found in this formation in coal mines with lots of vertebrae, things like that. And then they were discovered by a team in there, and then they were like, oh, these are actually from a giant snake. That's really interesting. 
Though uh, most material of Titanoboa c- comes from before the Cloaca. They seem to have a really robust body, things like that, which is really, really interesting. And the jaws themselves were weakly um, elanchronized, which means they were not strongly connected to the jawbone, which allowed them to kind of open their mouths and uh, jump over things like that. Uh, based on the size of the vertebrae, these guys would have been much larger than most snakes today. Uh, largest estimates put them about uh, 12, uh, 12.82 meters or 42.1 feet uh, with a margin area of like 2 meters or so. And um, the later discovery of uh, skull material allowed for size proportions based on that. And adjusting um, anaconda proportions of a 40 centimeter skull suggests that Titanoboa may have reached about 14.3 meters as well. So potentially a 14, 50 meter long snake is possible. And weight determines from based off the extant green anaconda and the southern rock python, python resulted in uh, weights between 652 kilograms or 1,437 pounds and 1,819 pounds or 4,000 pounds, which kind of uh, means estimates about 1,000 kilograms, which is pretty interesting. Uh, these estimates actually far exceed that of modern snakes and even the previous uh, record holder, a Gigantophus, another giant snake. So these guys would have been quite huge. So in terms of classification, these guys have been placed within the boa day. So these are related to uh, other boas, such as, uh, um, of course, uh, anacondas and those kind of boas. Uh, boa constrictors as well and um, the skull material confirms that placement within its family as well which is really really interesting and um, it seems to be related to other boas in that regard so in terms of the habitat it was living in at the time the uh, south america was still very much hot jungle this was uh, even hotter than it was now these guys would have been living in wet tropical rainforests with large river systems as well and um, they would have been filled with all sorts of cool animals such as the large uh, crocodile and thracosuchus uh, also other types of crocodiles, giant tortoises, um, giant turtles, I mean, uh, lots of really big reptiles and um, some other large uh, like mammals, things like that as well. But these guys would have been seemed to be mostly eating fish, uh, though, though that's true for modern anacondas as well. They would be mostly eating fish, but a big uh, turtle or a big uh, crocodile would not be out of the question for this guy, I don't think. So initially they thought to be more like modern anacondas and be eating uh kind of large animals but noting the skull they have different adaptions for being piscivorous or eating fish and they actually show a lot of adaptations for more similar to fish more similar to snakes i mean that have a very piscivorous uh, lifestyle so they may have actually been quite unique along uh, among the boards so a very adapted fish eating one which is really really cool this really shows that um how different the ecology of titanoboa was compared to um, anacondas and really just makes it seem more distinct than anaconda so it isn't just a giant anaconda a giant giant anaconda you could say but i think just that makes it, uh titanoboa much more interesting and um, the existence of uh, Titanoboa really interests, intrigues a lot of people about um, the climate of the time because there's been looking into correlations between uh, gigantism and uh, has habitats. So these guys as an endotherm because they need the outside um, world to regulate their body temperature since they can't produce heat themselves. This shows that a lot of... Um, the heat at the time, because the, right after the end of the uh, KPG or the end of the dinosaurs, the world was much hotter than it was now. There was like a tropical forest in Greenland and things like that. And um, they seem to think that the world could be quite a bit hotter in these local regions than it was. Though there have been some uh, people that have distinguished, uh, kind of dismissed that idea, considering we have the world's largest monitor lizard, uh, Varanus priscus, or the Megalania, living just 40,000 years ago in Australia, so it's more like an ecology thing. But um, yeah, really, really interesting. I do love these guys. Uh, Titanoboa really came out well. It really, really came out nicely. Really, really long and beautiful animals. Really, really awesome. So... Um, we're going to be moving on to our next animal here. So uh, let's let them swim off and do their thing. Just want to make sure they're avoiding the hatchery because I don't want them interfering. Okay, so next up by HyperGST, Leaf and Luca did the Titanoboa. Really wonderful job. But now we're moving to HyperGST, uh, Hyper or HyperSGYT, if you say that. We've got everyone's favorite big bad fish. We have got Zyphactinus. So 
let's see if we can find one out swimming in the open ocean blue. Let's have one over here by itself so we can get a good look. Oh, no, not quite yet. They get a good one to get a good picture with. Oh, here we are. Here is our Zyvactinus. So Zyvactinus is a really, really cool fish. Uh, comes from the Latin and Greek for sword ray. These guys are an extinct genus of large predatory marine bony fish that lived in the late Cretaceous from the Albion to Bactrictian. And um, when it was alive, it looked like a giant tarpan. So really interesting <laughs> animal as well. Uh, the type species kind of um, Zyphectinus adux has been found in Kansas around the 1950s. It was where it was first 1850s where it was first discovered in the Ubarra Chalk. And lots of formations around uh, the east coast of the United States, as well as Europe, Australia, Canada, Venezuela, and Argentina. So in terms of its paleoecology, these guys were quite voracious fish. Uh, at least a dozen specimens have been found with large fish in their um, stomachs. Especially there's one with a fossil called Fish Within a Fish that was collected by um, George F. Sternberg, which is a 1.9 meter long fish, or a fish that's 6 foot 2, in the um, stomach of a large Zyphectinus, which is about four, uh, 5 or 6 meters long, I think, about 5 meters or so, uh, found in Kansas, which is really interesting. And like many other species uh, in the Lake Cretaceous Oceans, uh, dead specimens were kind of found with uh, bites of other sharks, such as Tetoxorana, on them as well. And um, sadly, we don't really know much about the larval or juvenile stages of Zyphectinus. The smallest fossil we have is a lower jaw that's estimated to be from an individual about 30 centimeters long. And these guys were large fish. Their ecology was often very much like a tarp, um, giant tarpan, eating pretty much what they, they could get their mouths around on that seafood diet, of course. So they have been with their mouths open, trying to catch whatever prey they can. And... Um, there's also been found even with the bones of a mosasaur um, between its jaws, or the flipper of a mosasaur, uh, which is really, really interesting. And um, yeah, these guys were those large predators swimming around. They would have been kind of a mid-level predator. They would have been fed on upon by mosasaurs, but they'd feed on smaller marine reptiles, uh, fish, baby mosasaurs, again, that seafood diet. But yeah, really, really awesome fish. Uh, there's kind of two species. There's Ardex inventus, which is the other one. But yeah, really, really awesome fish. I really enjoy how this guy's come out. So yeah, uh, HyperGST did a really wonderful job this guy. So next up, we're moving up to some really cool new animals here. Uh, this is not Megalosaurus, but we've got uh, Allosaurus, uh, remade by Jagged Fang Designs. And we'll get a good look at the anatomy of this one here. So really, really cool. So you can see here, this is uh, one of the five different variants you can kind of get. Uh, you can each download them all separately, including like the Walking with Dinosaurs one. That looks like the one from Walking with Dinosaurs, the one from Path of Titans, things like that. This is the original JFD skin that they've made, or Jagged Fan Design skin. Uh, though you can all download them each from the Steam page, or not the Steam page, the uh, Nexus mod page, uh, which is really, really cool. And... Um, you can just decide and you have to put it over your Megalosaurus. be very interesting once they manage to get a cosmetic on uh, or a variant, once they get the cosmetics or variants sorted, to be able to put this on the Allosaurus. But really, really awesome as you can kind of see here. Uh, very typical Jacket Fan Design style. Uh, this is obviously based off Allosaurus Fragilis with that really interesting skull there and also that large chin he's got going on here. Really beautiful crest going on here. That really beautiful uh, detail of the... Um, scales there looks really really awesome this is a completely new model that they've made and just ported it over you can see those changes to those big beefy arms with those large claws there and um they put it on the megalosaurus because i think it fits much better on the rig you can see those long legs and large feet and those long long tail it looks rather nice if i do say so myself definitely looks like allosaurus um, I think they didn't want to put it as well on the original Allosaurus because uh, Fragilis is only about 8 or 9 meters long. Though there are potentially some super big individuals that could be Seraphagonax or whatever. It's kind of a bit of whatever. But yeah, this pretty much is what Allosaurus looked like. And Jagged Fang Designs really knocked it out of the park. I think really gave him that accurate anatomy, especially that skull there. And they give us a very interesting crest. Of course, really, really cool. And those big beefy arms. 
really truly wonderful i'm definitely a big fan big big fan uh, of the allosaurus that they made for us so let them all walk off and do their thing and then we'll cover a really cool mod that we're coming up here so we've got here this next one is done by um dark uh, harlequins ego uh, and incrinix of uh, cretaceous calamity we have got uh, two variants of the t-rex so this is the first one this is the cretaceous calamity variant Oh, uh, we can see here a wonderful new Tyrannosaurus. So this obviously just goes over the uh, Tyrannosaurus. So we need to add a new thing. So these are all cosmetic variants. I'll get into that right before I release the last one. But you can see um, there's two different variants. This is the Cretaceous Calamity. The next one I'll be covering is the Marvelous Cal um, variant. And they each come with a bunch of different skins, uh, very similar to the other versions of, in the game. So you have like different variants and different colors with the same pattern pretty much but yeah it really has come out wonderfully this is like if you guys have seen the original like Jurassic World Evolution one this has been ported into the new one and it just looks so beautiful this is pretty much what Tyrannosaurus would have looked like you can see the changes of the skull there the very long skull big bosses and the keratin along the uh, jaw there very big extensive lips as well and this is kind of the more extreme colored one because you can see the reddish and the uh, yellowish going down here, but it still looks so wonderful. Love the patterns on it as well. Really, really awesome. It's pretty spot on for T-Rex. He's got these big lips. How wonderful does he look? And you can see the accurate uh, hands there with the second one being slightly longer and the uh, first one being bigger, uh, slightly thicker and all that. Right feet, I think they're a little bit smaller than the, uh, uh, the original Jurassic Park ones. And you can see that greatly extended tail. And you can see the detail of the uh, scales on there tyrannosaurus would have very tiny scales along there you can also see some details of the scales on the lips as well really has come out wonderfully so um we'll let you can see how this is a really nice scientifically accurate uh tyrannosaurus so this is probably the one i would recommend above all others in terms of scientific accuracy because it's basically perfect and um we'll let them run off and do their thing this was originally part of like a jurassic world uh, not jurassic world zoo tycoon 2 mod which uh was going to have Cretaceous Calamity and have all sorts of like Cretaceous dinosaurs, but um, they've been ported into Jurassic World Evolution 1 and 2 now, finally. But we can see here if we go into our genome library, we can go down to see Tyrannosaurus Rex. Let's have a look. Here's our T Rex, and then we move into genome. So, what we can go in here is we can see here there's all the original skins, Big ED, da da da, then Cretaceous Calamity, and then we have a few dozen skins from Cretaceous Calamity. And then we have the Marvelous skin, which comes from here, or here, and then it's all the uh, skins in that from there. So two different skins, and then you can also change the color and patterns as well. So not only do we have uh, your basically the ability to have your traditional Jurassic Park T-Rex, now you can have your hyper-accurate uh, realistic T-Rex or paleo-accurate T-Rex, which is really, really awesome. So before we end off this video, I want to show off this one. This is... The other skin I consider kind of my favorite in terms of like looking flashy and cool is because it's got the red head and the end of red tail. But this one I consider the most paleo accurate because most likely um, since this guy's an active predator, T-Rex would have been needing to camouflage somewhat and be able to break its outline and uh, be able to catch prey and being bright red is not the best advantage for that. But we can see here this is the marvelous skin, the base one, and I think this is probably the most realistic skin out of them all. So let's uh, have a look. So you can see here, look at this wonderful skin. And you can see here, it's a lot darker. And there's also variation. You get like greenish ones and things like that. But this one is the kind of the basic uh, brown one. But you can see how beautiful this looks and how well it translates. This probably is the most accurate one. You still get these really interesting bands of color down its tail there, helping to break that counter shading in. You can see the dark lighter underside and the darker top side with some stripes going on there. 
And you can do this without the pattern as well, and it looks just as wonderful. Really, really awesome. I just love this guy. I love the keratin bosses and stuff like that around the eyes there. And just love how the face looks. This is pretty much what T-Rex would have looked like in real life, which is really cool. It feels like almost like you've just gone back into the Cretaceous and you've gone and seen a T-Rex and it's like, this is what the animal would have looked like, flesh and all. It just feels like a real animal, which is a really hard thing to achieve in a lot of paleo art. But Cretaceous Calamity really did a great job of um, showing this off. So, um, yeah, we got to th thank Doc, Harlequin's Ego, and in um, Inquirix, I believe you say that, or Inquirinox, or something like that. Of um, Sorry, I'm not the best at pronouncing names, but um, Inquirinox uh, for giving us these models and porting them in. So remember, there's all those variants, you can upload them in and uh, put them in your game. And then you have these two different variants, the Marvelous, which is this one, and the Cretaceous Calamity, which is the kind of brighter one over here. And you can pick and choose, and you still also have all your cool JP-style Rex and even have them fight each other if you want. So that's also really, really cool. And these guys have truly come out wonderfully. Really, really awesome mod. So um, I think this would be a great place to finish up. So um, yeah, I... Uh, Really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified. Don't anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.